talking a little bit of all the different surgical areas and different things that are pretty much, I guess, the, uh, the chameleons, the ones that just sort of hide um, within that you can't really see and or the ones that um, may look suspicious, especially for the, the lay person, but are completely benign, separate keratosis and some of the others. Why don't you describe a little bit of, of the different ones, what to look for, um, what sort of makes it a benign, and, and in a sense, I know we, we've always talked about the ABCs sure. and go over those. Um, sort of a broad topic, easy uh, <laughs> place to start is the most common, that being uh, the seborrheic keratosis. We see lots of these. A lot of people refer to these as age spots or wisdom spots, and uh, they're completely benign. Uh, essentially what it is is an overgrowth of the, the top portion of the skin, and it uh, results in a uh, usually a darker, uh, thickened uh, spot on the back, and, and a lot of times they can grow and change a little bit on you, so uh, following sort of the ABCD rule, uh, they can uh, give you a little bit of a scare. It's something that's relatively easy to pick out as a dermatologist. That being said, uh, there are a few instances where you can have a melanoma arising within one of these seborrheic keratoses. So Hiding within it. Correct. Right. Because they're both dark spots uh, on the skin and that are growing or changing or evolving. So certainly if uh, something's behaving abnormally, it's uh, wise to at least get it looked at and see. And occasionally we'll have one that we need to biopsy here or there just to make sure. Just because it may look a little bit suspicious. Right. And hard to tell. But I know as I've seen quite a few separate keratoses in my years as well in my practice. Um, probably the best way I'd always used to call them is the barnacles. And right. sometimes right. when you see uh, even your grandmother or something like that on the back, even it doesn't have to be sun exposed areas as I know. Um, and they just a ton of a lot of little black speckles raised. And as I said, I, I call them barnacles. And um, just and obviously. A very accurate description. They, they appear like barnacles for the, the most part. Some of them can be rather flat, but most of them will raise up a little bit. Right. Uh, what makes them benign is they don't metastasize. They won't ever kill you. Uh, they can get large and somewhat unsightly. Right. But, uh, Especially if they're uh, in areas such as your face. Right. There is really no metastatic potential and uh, no potential for harm, so uh, they do not need to be treated. Gotcha. Uh, they can be treated cosmetically if that's a concern. Shaved. Just remove them, burn them. Yeah, and some of the thinner ones can be treated with liquid nitrogen as okay. well and frozen off. Interesting. Um, other areas, other things of concern? Um, those are our most common benign uh, lesions that we see mm -hmm. uh, other than uh, sort of a benign mole or nevi. And that's where it starts to get a little bit uh, difficult to um, differentiate if a mole's changing. Is it still benign? Is it gone on to become dysplastic or atypical? Other things that we see... Uh, other small little red spots called the cherry angioma, very common. Usually by the time you're 35 to 40, you stop growing new moles and you start growing the seborrheic keratoses and the cherry angiomas. Or uh, barnacles, <laughs> just red barnacles. Uh, those just tend to be flat red spots that you see. Um, then we move on to different uh, uh, things like overgrown oil glands, very common on the face, head, and neck area called a sebaceous hyperplasia. Mm -hmm. uh, those are completely benign as well. Uh, do not need any treatment necessarily. That being said, those can look similar to a basal cell skin cancer if they get uh, uh, to be growing too rapidly. Uh, other ones move on more towards the precancerous or low-grade cancerous uh, type lesions, such as an actinic keratosis, which is considered a precancerous lesion, uh, and that will uh, potentially evolve into something called a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, another low-grade form of skin cancer that's slightly right. more aggressive than a basal cell carcinoma. Referred to as AKs. Um, Correct. A lot of the AKs. And I know I've seen quite a few of them, and probably to describe them, at least that I recognize and the ones I've seen, sort of a red scaly, sort of a lightish red, tend to be a little scaly. Um, it looks almost... Right. They appear rather benign uh, for the most part. You, you look at them and you think, oh, I just have a little red scaly spot, and it's not really any big deal. They uh, occasionally can be scratched off, but they'll continue to grow back. Gotcha. And now, obviously, we have, I've seen patients and even some people with them, and I know we probably have some pictures of them, and they can be extensive, pretty much all over the forehead, all over the face, arms, um, and pretty ex extensive in that. Yes, we see quite a bit of that, especially in men. Uh, we tend not to wear hats or sunscreens as much as we need to. Uh, people that uh, have a little bit of a receding hairline or some male pattern baldness will often have 
the entire scalp just covered uh, in these. Um, and they are also due to uh, cumulative uh, UV exposure and sun damage. Which uh, brings up a great topic right now. Obviously, UV, and, um, and I know that there's really three different types, that UVA, UVB, UVC. Uh, my understanding, UVC is pretty much blocked out completely by the, the atmosphere and the ozone layer. Um, a and B come down through. That speaking, I know a lot of people will talk about it. it's like, well, tanning beds, because it's a UVA or a UVB or a combination. I, I know we were talking a little bit. What is the, the real consensus now on tanning beds, period? I know there's been a little bit of wanting to tax it, wanting to really try to decrease and discourage the use, especially in adolescents and teens. Um, I, I guess where is that coming from and what science is behind that? Well, over the last 10 years, we've seen a uh, dramatic increase in the number of uh, skin cancers that have been linked to tanning bed use. Uh, tanning beds largely will use uh, UVA type radiation or, or ultraviolet uh, radiation. Uh, that will make you red. It tends not to give you any uh, long-term darkening. Uh, the UVB that we get from being outside between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. often will stimulate the pigment cells in your skin to darken, which is a protective effect, and that gives you the longer-term tan if you will. Right. Uh, uh, what the American Academy of Dermatology is really coming out uh, uh, and, and pushing for now is to limit the use of tanning beds and make people aware that there is a significantly higher link towards melanoma skin cancer uh, as well as other non-melanoma skin cancers, but specifically melanoma due to the frequent tanning bed use. Now, is that frequent? How about some of the patients that just say, yeah, I do a little bit here and there to try to maintain color, or uh, may do a little bit before going on a trip um, just to try to get a base tan. Is, is, are they really finding that pretty much any usage of it is, for the most part, bad? That's a great question. To my knowledge, we have not determined the exact number or average number of sessions in a tanning bed uh, from a poll of some of the uh, dermatologists, it seems uh, greater than 10 to 12 uh, tanning bed sessions will increase your risk to some degree, but nobody has the exact number. Any of the raw data on that? Interesting. Obviously, um, and I know we talked a little bit earlier and during the break, we were going over of, uh, of the use, and some patients, and I've even had it, and even um, some theories and being told that I usually go to the tanning, not me personally, but I've heard it said that going to the tanning bed, um, let's say a few times to get that base tan so you don't burn be the, before the season. Is there validity on that um, to try to get a little bit of jump start so we don't burn or is there? Very small uh, amount of validity that the tanning bed will ultimately do more harm than it does good in terms of trying to get you a base tan. Uh, <clears throat> the UVA light that is typically used in there will give you a little bit of uh, short term darkening but does not uh, change the behavior of your skin in terms of what the, the melanocytes do to darken the skin and give you the protective effect. Uh, it takes slow cumulative UVB type doses in order to get there. And sort of that slow cumulative. Um, and then obviously first and foremost then to prevent that UVA, UVB damage right. is sunscreen. And, and, and yes. And obviously within that, and I, I know, I mean we have quite a few different ones here that are very, very high on zinc oxide, titanium oxide, some of these that are really just working as a barrier. Is there a difference between sort of the different ones, um, the sort of the higher end? I mean, we have some that are quite a bit more expensive versus some of the stuff that's just over the counter, um, Tropicana, some of the things like that. Uh, not necessarily. There are a very uh, wide arrangement of sunscreens and uh, often have high priced ingredients, but essentially what you need is a, a physical blocker. There are several different chemical blockers that sort of change the behavior of what the sun does in your skin, but there's still some damage that can persist through there. The physical blockers, zinc and titanium, seem to be the most protective and most beneficial, and you can find several over-the-counter versions uh, of sunscreens that are very reasonably priced that contain those. Gotcha. I guess one of the things that I've noticed um, through the years, because Obagi, for instance, has a whole range of the sunscreens, along with Image and some of these other ones that we carry here. The titanium and the zinc oxide um, basically are micro small, and they actually do penetrate and they do block a little bit better without necessarily showing that pure white. Probably right. the best zinc oxide out there 
is what we used to wear as kids and just completely cover our noses with, but we were... Nobody's going to... Not a lot of people anymore. are going to walk around at work with right. big old areas of the, on their nose and cheeks. Um, with that, and obviously I know there's a lot of, uh, everybody knows when you're going outside, going to the pool, doing things like that to put it on. What about a day-to-day -day basis? What about just right now? I mean, uh, every day. Uh, one thing that is often overlooked is the effect of the sun when you're riding in a car. The glass on the windshield will block some of the UVB. It does not block the UVA, and you can still get a significant amount of damaging UV radiation while uh, in a car, and a lot of people don't think about that or forget that. Yeah, actually, it was interesting. I had a, uh, one of the Derm magazines or Derm books I was looking at, and had a gentleman who lived in Chicago. He was a delivery guy and spent 30, 40 years just driving around Chicago, and one side of his face, on the, usually on the, obviously on the left side, and as he, since he was driving, extensive um, wrinkling, extensive sun damage, and the right side was uh, look like a 40-year-old, and um, and obviously that can be the big change. We're going to take a quick break again. Um, stay tuned. We're going to dive in a little bit more. Um, we definitely have some good photos that we'll be interjecting within things to look for, um, whether it's the melanomas, basal cells, all of these. And uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> 